Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Middle East Studies. I am James Dorsey, the co-host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to David H. Warren about his new book, Rivals in the Gulf, Yusuf al Karadawi, Abdullah bin Baya, and the Guthrie UAE Contest over the Arab Spring and the Gulf Crisis. It's a mouthful, but it goes to key questions at the heart of developments in the Muslim world, as well as the wider world, as a result of the Ukraine crisis, democracy versus autocracy. David looks at the issue through the lens of two of the foremost Middle Eastern religious protagonists and their backers, Egyptian-born Qadari national Yusuf al Karadawi, widely seen as advocating an Islamic concept of democracy, and UAE-backed Abdullah bin Baya, who legitimizes in religious terms autocratic rule in the UAE as well as elsewhere. In doing so, David raises the question whether the concept of an Islamic democracy is on par with liberal democracy, or simply a form of a curtailed democracy in which religion imposes limitations. David Warren, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, James. Um, it's great to be here. We have a lot to cover in the next hour, but let's start with your intellectual biography. Tell us about the journey that took you to writing this book. So I think the journey that um, took me to writing this book was I began my PhD studies um, in around, around the time the Arab Spring was just beginning. And I think for many PhD students of that um, generation, um, thinking about the Arab Spring as it unfolded um, really shaped many of our studies. And uh, for me, um, that journey ultimately took me uh, to the Gulf states, which were um, states that I think were oftentimes seen on the periphery of events as they were unfolding, but as it became clear um, and has become more clear since, um, are really at the center of um, Arab politics. Um, and I would just say, in response to your um, introduction to the book, um, and of course we'll unpack this in more detail, um, I certainly don't see um, my book as critiquing an idea of Islamic democracy versus liberal democracy. I think um, my book is more interested in um, global processes by which um, Muslim thinkers and non-Muslim thinkers are thinking together um, about what democracy means um, and what concepts like majority and minority mean. Um, so I certainly wouldn't see myself as um, raising question marks of the idea about um, mm. democracy um, in the Muslim world, or that being problematic relationships between mm. Islam and democracy in that sense. Um, Fair enough. I, I, I wasn't necessarily implying that there is a problem, that, or an Islamic problem with democracy, as much more the concept of whether there is an Islamic concept of democracy and whether that's on par with, with liberal democracy. But we'll get to all of that uh, as we proceed, the larger context of your book is religion as part of Emirati and Qadri state branding and foreign mm -hmm. and security policy. Perhaps we can start the discussion of your book of, on why is religion important to the branding and foreign security policies uh, of these two states and how religion figures into it. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think when I was thinking about this book, um, one audience I had in mind um, was an audience in the political science and international relations um, community that, um, in a more simplistic sense, think about um, Islam as an object that states instrumentalize um, for their domestic policy to legitimize regimes and so on. And what I was thinking about in this book is that in the Gulf states, um, and perhaps also across the region as a whole, that's not the case. Um, people like uh, Sheikh Yusuf al Qaladawi or Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayer um, are not involved in um, legitimizing the local Qatari or Emirati government. The Qatari or Emirati security services do not need um, Islamic legitimization to um, affirm their rule. So that question, um, moving away from domestic security policy, led me to think about foreign policy. And in the book, I use a concept of state branding. This is the idea that small states, um, Qatar, the UAE, like so on, um, have to brand themselves like companies in a way in order to garner 
foreign investment, as it were. In the case of these small states like Qatar and the UAE, um, this investment comes in the form of outside powers, most notably since the Qatar Doctrine in the United States, that invest, as it were, in maintaining the security of the Qatari and Emirati royal families. Um, and then since the 1990s, and also, of course, since after 9-11, um, as the United States has increasingly searched for partners um, to, um, as it understands it, reform Islam from within, um, both Qatar and the UAE in different ways have sought to present themselves as important and essential partners in that project um, in different ways. So I see um, the sponsorship of um, Islamic scholars and thinking about Islamic soft power um, as an effort to um, demonstrate the importance of maintaining Qatar and the UAE as independent and secure states um, in the face either from external aggression from larger partners like um, Saudi Arabia, Iraq or Iran, who at various times have all claimed um, territory or threatened these states, or from internal challenges to democracy for which the United States is the backer of last resort um, against that. Before we get into greater depth on, on what you just said, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about who, is, who Yusuf al-Karadawi and Abdullah bin Baya are and how they helped shape policies in both Qatar and the UAE. Yes, thank you. So um, certainly Yusuf al-Karadawi, um, an Egyptian scholar born in 1926, um, is arguably... Um, the most well-known um, and certainly the most written about um, Ayla, um, in the Arab world. Um, and he um, moves to Qatar in 1961. And in the book, um, and during the Arab Spring, he is perhaps um, the most iconic, most prominent figure um, to speak to unfolding events um, from an Islamic um, traditional perspective, as it were, using Islamic legal terms and concepts. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a figure who's been written about um, at some length. And what I was interested in this book is that oftentimes when he is written about, it is almost as though he were in Cairo. Um, whereas for me, for my book, it's very important to emphasize and highlight the significance of the fact that since 1961, he has been in Doha and he is a Qatari national, right? And although he is very invested in Egyptian debates and Egyptian events and Egyptian politics, um, the Qatari context um, and his relationships with the Qatari royal family, um, shape um, his view of the world and the way he engages things. Um, Abdullah bin Bayya is a slightly younger scholar, um, born in, born to a scholarly family in Mauritania. Um, he uh, serves in the Mauritanian government um, as a younger man, and his uh, he moves to uh, the UAE or had develops a relationship with the UAE much later. Um, really, it's of 2013, 2014. Um, but in this book. I spell out that rather than um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya um, engaging with the UAE simply through politics of convenience as he tries to find sponsorship for a rival project, rather I spell out that really going back to the 1970s, um, there has been a long relationship between uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya and um, the Al Nahyan um, royal family, um, particularly Sheikh Zayed um, Al Nahyan, the founder of the UAE, who in the 1970s makes a number of high profile visits to Mauritania. Um, and at that time, the UAE is the largest foreign donor to Mauritania by some margin. And so their relationship goes back um, to that point. So in this book, I'm sketching out um, the long histories of the relationship between these two prominent scholars and these two prominent royal families, um, the Qatari royal family and the Emirati royal family, um, to highlight the ways that um, personal relationships and personal histories shape the way that um, religious scholars think about events and intervene in events as they unfold. Uh, you use the word shape both in the, in the, um, the impact of Karadawi and Binbaya, and I, I realize that you argue that Binbaya, that the UA did not need Binbaya to leg legitimize their regime. Nonetheless, having said that, Shaping certainly in the case of Karadawi is quite evident, and you see that in, you know, Gutter's advocacy of um, of democracy of of all kinds of rights, even if they they don't implement that at home. Whereas, Bimbaya certainly gave religious legitimacy to the autocratic form of government in the in in the UAE. Uh, 
and, and in that sense probably shaped far less, uh, but was more of a more of a, a useful tool. Or would you disagree with that characterization? No, thank you. That's a really good question, actually. Um, and I really appreciate it because I chose the word um, shaped in the book very carefully because I was pointing out or thinking about what exactly is the role of these prominent scholars and what exactly is the substance of their relationship with um, Qatar and Emirati policy. Um, because um, it's not as if um, Yusuf al or Abdullah bin Bayer, um sit with and influence um, Qatari and Emirati officials or family members. So what I did was um, I used this word shaped to suggest that the concepts, or to spell out rather, the concepts and terms that Abdullah bin Bayer uses for when he characterizes the region are then taken up and repeated by Emirati officials to justify policies that they have already decided upon. What I mean by that is, um, for example, Abdullah bin Bayer often talks about um, the chaos in religious discourse. And he talks about the chaos of the fatwa. And what he means by that is he characterizes the cause of regional conflict in religious terms. And because of that, if the cause of conflict is due to um, misinterpretations of Islamic texts and traditions, as Abdullah bin Bayer characterizes it, that's not simply um, an act of capitulation to the hegemonic characterization of the regions of caricaturing it in these terms. Rather, it's actually an act of claim making, um, because I argue that if um, religious chaos is a cause of conflict in the Arab world, suitably empowered religious experts, i.e. Abdullah bin Bayya and the ulama at large, are the solution. Right? And for the UAE, um, this worldview is something that they repeat in interviews, they repeat to justify their policies, to say that um, intervention or supporting autocracy is needed because of the chaos and religious discourse um, as a way of um, imagining the causes of conflict and therefore imagining the solutions, right? And um, simplifying what are other very complex, otherwise very complex um, social and political factors. Um, in the case of Koladawi, um, partly due to the the decades he spent in the country of Qatar, I, um, in the first chapter of the book, I detail um, his sort of long-running influence in the way that he and um, his Egyptian colleagues um, from the ulama, uh, from al azhar come really as a form of, to fill a kind of skilled labor shortage, as it were, um, in Qatar at the time, among um, professionally trained as Islamic scholars. And over time, over the decades that follow, he and his primarily um, Egyptian peers ultimately supplant um, and marginalize the local Qatari um, scholarly establishment, which is how, um, over time, they become um, the established elite in Qatar, although they are originally from um, Egypt, by and large. I guess another way of approaching uh, what your book do, does is to to say it details two seemingly different religiously grounded approaches towards political governance, one backed by Qatar, the other by the UAE. One favors peaceful popular revolts, democratic elections, and the toppling of autocrats. The other favors unconditional upholding of a ruler's authority. Yet in essence, and I think, seem to think that that's part of what you argue, but correct me if I'm wrong, the views that are put forward by the two main protagonists, Karadawi and Bimbaya, are also very similar in major respects. Can you unpack that for us? Yes, thank you. Um, and I think, and I really appreciate your characterization there of what I'm suggesting, is that really, um, in many elements, um, at the most foundational mm -hmm. level, um, the approach um, and understanding of Karadawi and Bimbaya um, is quite similar, actually, um, although it takes very different directions. Um, for example, in the book, I talk about um, the concept of uh, shura, or consultation, as it emerges in the Qur'an, and the way that both of both Qaradawi and Bin Bayya understand consultative government as a, uh, within, as having an inherent moral valence right, and having a legitimacy to it. Um, where they differ is to what extent is democracy um, the best form of consultative government. Qaradawi sees um, democracy as having an inherent um, moral valence as being the best form and the most appropriate form of consultative government. For Bin Bayer, that's not the case. Um, for him, 
um, a government should certainly consult its people and should consult representatives of its people who know the affairs of a community intimately and can argue on that community's behalf. But for him, selecting those representatives um, through elections is not is no better or no worse or in, um, than a democ- democratic elections. Or in fact, based on Abdullah bin Mayer's reading of history, most notably um, the Algerian civil war, for example, he sees democracy in the Arab world um, as actually a lesser form of government than other kinds of consultation, um, which in his for, in his idea are actually better. Um, there's also another a number of other areas um, where uh, Kaladawi and Bimbe um, share similar approaches. Um, Kaladawi also um, is deeply concerned about what he considers to be the chaos of religious discourse, but in different ways. Um, and both of them share a foundational anxiety of the relationship between um, the individual believer, um, who in the modern period they understand as someone who can um, reassign texts for themselves um, and make decisions for themselves in terms of Islamic norms, and the authority of the scholar, which is an anxiety they also both share. Um, so yes, there are many similarities at the foundations of their thought, the way they make their arguments, um, and then they take different directions, rather than seeing them as two sort of essentially um, foundationally different approaches. You seem to also argue that one similarity is that they uh, both advocate a majoritarian type of governance that basically puts the collective or, or the state uh, or puts the collective above the individual. Um, is that a is that a correct interpretation of what you're what you're arguing? And also, I I, I noted that while on the one hand you did focus on individual rights, you don't seem to focus on minority rights. Yeah, yeah. For me, in this short book, um, I was le- I was thinking about. Um, less about the long um, intellectual history of Islamic thought. And here I was more focusing on um, the way that these scholars um, think about modern events, right? The um, aftermath of the invasion of Iraq and how that shapes their interventions or the Algerian civil war in the case of Ben Beya. Um, but to go back to your question, I was thinking about... Um, What shaped my approach um, to thinking about democracy um, with Carl Dawi, first of all, um, was what I call the Bahrain exception, right? Um, the way that I was thinking about, he was somebody in the Arab Spring who um, is very vocal and very supportive of the Tunisian uprising, the Egyptian uprising, um, the Libyan uprising, the Syrian uprising, and so on. Um, but Bahrain is an exception. And for me, um, that was a problem that needed to be um, unpacked and resolved. And so as I thought about how to think about that exception, when he, um, in contrast to everyone else, says um, the Bahraini uprising is an armed sectarian uprising, it's an Iranian plot, and so on and so forth, um, which also coheres with um, Qatar's and Al Jazeera's characterization of the uprising as well, I was thinking about... um, the way that he imagines who the public are and who, who on whose behalf he is speaking, right? And so I was thinking about um, drawing on work like Khaled Abul Fadl or Well Halak to say that um, Sheikh Yusuf al in particular um, does not appear to have reflected on the role of the modern nation state. And the way the modern state is something new and new, um, new and new, unique, and um, closes off certain interpretive possibilities while opening up others. Um, yeah. And then, when it comes to um, Abdullah bin Bey, I think also um, I'm somebody who draws on the work of Will Halak and the Impossible State to think about the way that the state um, shapes bin Bey's thought, also um, in terms of what is possible um, with democratic government was not possible. Uh, one, you've touched on this, but I wanted to go a little bit more into depth on it. it one of the key differences in the approaches of Karadawi and Bindawi, Bimbaya is the relationship of Islamic scholars to the state. So for his part, Karadawi was very close to Qatari rulers, but always maintained a degree of independence. He never was formally a, 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 a 
on the state's payroll. On the other hand, Bin Bayer feared what he called, and you mentioned the chaos of the fatwa, that needed to be avoided by ensuring that scholars had the endorsement of the state. It was a concept that UAE rulers adopted and sought to implement with the creation of uh, institutions like the um, the Forum for the Promotion of Peace in Muslim Societies and the Emirati Fatwa Council. And you also noted that Bin Bayer defines peace not, as not associated with justice or accountability in contradiction to... Um, to Karadawi. Can you work that all out for us a bit? Thank you. So um, in the book, um, first we're thinking about the relationship between the ulama and the state. Um, to begin with the basic um, debate I'm engaging with, um, I argue that Qatar and the UAE are very different um, from other Arab states that have been studied by academics. Um, for example, such as Egypt or Saudi Arabia, where there are large um, local um, ulama establishments with which the state must engage. Um, Qatar and the UAE are different, in which um, the scholarly elite are by and large um, not from those countries, um, and therefore there's a certain kind of vulnerability, um, which means that um, forms of there are other forms of disciplining open to Qatar and the UAE that would not be open um, to Egypt and Saudi Arabia, for example. And when it comes to independence, um, I show in the early chapters of the book the way that um, the relationship between Khalil Dawi and the Qatari royal family um, unfolds. And I show that, in a sense, um, while Yusuf al Dawi has the space um, to speak his mind as he sees fit as events unfold, um, the way that the Qatari regime exerts discipline on Khalil Dawi when they diverge is not through... Um, imprisoning him, for example, or exiling him, for example, because that in turn would show that Qadai was in fact never independent at all. And it suits the Qataris to bring to um, acknowledge him when it suits them and distance themselves from him when it does not suit them. So if you institutionalize his position as say a Grand Mufti, you would not have that say the Qataris would not have that freedom to draw them close to them or distance themselves from him as and when it suited them. Rather, um, the relationship during the Arab Spring suited both of them, or suited the Qataris very well. So when he was engaging events as he saw fit um, in a way that cohered with the Qataris, um, it suited them very well to give him a platform to do so. When later on, um, certainly as the Qataris um, and Qadwai diverge over the rising violence in Syria in 2013, or the Egyptian coup in 2013, um, what the Qataris do um, rather than disciplining him in a way that might happen in Egypt or Saudi Arabia, um, they um, remove, him, remove him from the airwaves, first of all, um, with cancelling his program, um, Sharia and Life on Al Jazeera. Um, and also they circulate rumours um, that he's going to be deported and stripped of his citizenship, right? which is a particular kind of discipline that's open to Qatar and the UE, but wouldn't be open um, to Egypt, for example, a more subtle form. Um, now, when it comes to um, Abdullah bin Bayer, um, what I talk about in terms of his view of the state and the state's relationship with him is there's a kind of circular reasoning um, that's unfolding. For Abdullah bin Bayer, um, he expresses deep anxiety and deep concern at what he sees mm. as um, the fading authority of the ulama and what he calls the chaos of religious discourse. Um, and what I highlight is that one key reason for that um, fading authority um, is increasing associations between the ulama and the state, of which Abdullah bin Bayer is perhaps a great example. Um, but bin Bayer's solution to that problem of the ulama's um, sort of fading authority, we might say, or sort of fragmentation of authority, um, is yet more state intervention in religious life. So his, his solution to the problem is the state needs to select and empower appropriately qualified ulama such as himself, um, to address this problem, um, which is in fact being created by state intervention into religious life in the first place. Um, it strikes me that there's another way of looking at what you've described as the disciplining, if you wish, of Karadawi, is, all, is that it was simply also convenient to take him out of public view at a moment that the views that he represented 
were uh, a problem in Qatar's relationships with, for example, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Yes, absolutely. And um, one of the things I talk about in the third chapter of the book is at during this period known as the Gulf crisis, which begins roughly 2014 and ends roughly 2020. Um, what happens is there are periods of ups and downs um, during the relationship, between, particularly between Qatar and the UAE. Um, and so during periods of um, tension between Qatar and the UAE, um, Qadawi is given um, space and a platform to speak how he wishes, which is a very critical of the UAE, particularly for their support for the Egyptian coup. And then during periods of detente between Qatar and the UAE, uh, Qadawi is um, marginalized and silenced for those periods of time. Um, and then um, during periods when um, Qatar is seeking out relations with Turkey, in particular, um, Qadawi is again given space um, to speak his mind once again, partly because his close relationships with um, Erdogan, for example, are very beneficial um, to this sort of soft power relationship between Qatar and Turkey um, during the Gulf crisis. If one looks at the support of Karadawi, of Qatar, of Al Jazeera for the 2011 popular Arab revolts, they were both the cl cleric's vision put into practice, as well an indication of the degree to which he had shaped the thinking of the Qatari elite. Would you agree that one reason for Karadawi's influence in Qatar's quest to maintain it, or is Qatar's quest to maintain a distance to Saudi Arabia and carve out a niche of its own, and that it also helped Qatar, as you sort of indicated early on, project itself as, as sharing to some degree American values, and in that way ensuring that the U.S. would be concerned about the Gulf state security? Yes, I think that's a, um, that is how I would see it. I think um, in the book I talk about uh, going back to um, Qatari-Saudi relations, um, there was a period of time um, before the 1990s, before Al Jazeera was founded, when um, Qatar was very much under um, Saudi Arabia's uh, security umbrella, as it were, um, for which um, Qatar accepted certain limits on its autonomy and um, accepted certain sort of Saudi um, meddling, as it were, in Qatari family politics. Um, the 1991 um, Gulf War um, shows to everyone, these small Gulf states, that Saudi Arabia cannot um, ensure security, and thus they increasingly look for other partners, most notably the United States. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned earlier in our talk, um, to ensure um, the United States remains invested in preserving Qatari security, um, Qatar is extremely useful um, for the way that Qatar brands itself. Um, on the one hand, sharing in a sort of democrat in democratic values um, abroad, at least, and free speech um, within certain limits, um, and promoting democracy throughout the region when that's something the US is interested in. Um, and it also, um, Qatar um, is part of a, a broader package whereby Qatar uh, presents itself as an important mediator with other groups, such as the Muslim Brotherhood, um, Hamas, and not so much connected to the Qadawi, um, but Qatar positions itself as a mediator um, with the Taliban, um, Iran, and so on and so forth. Um, so he's part of that broader package whereby Qatar asserts itself as an essential partner um, for US interests in the region. But there also is that, that, that element of distance to Saudi Arabia. So like the UAE, Qatar deliberately not wanting a, uh, a strong uh, indigenous uh, uh, class of ulama of, is, of Islamic scholars not wanting that uh, that power sharing agreement that Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. and Qatar of course being the only other state that at least nominally if you wish is a Wahhabi uh, or a majority Wahhabi state mm -hmm. and that in that sense Karadawi played a very important role in that it brought in a, uh, a, a, a religious element, a, 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 a prominent scholar and others, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time uh, could ensure that it would not be, be, be forced into, an, into something similar to, that, to mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, thank you. I'm re I really appreciate you raising that, um, that question because for a long time, um, it, was, it has been perceived as a conundrum as it were, in the academic community as to why um, Qatar and Saudi Arabia are so different in terms of relationships with the religious establishments. Um, Qatar, as you mentioned, 
um, since the early 20th century, has um, nominally been a uh, Wahhabi state, as it were, just like Saudi Arabia. And so this was a problem, well, an academic problem, as it were, um, I was interested in engaging with in the first chapter of the book. And what I do is um, sketch out how in the early 20th century, um, there was a sort of nascent um, Wahhabi um, scholarly elite um, emerging on the Qatari Peninsula at the time. Qatar, just to remind everyone, is still sort of very much a backwater at this time. It's a British protectorate. Oil and gas has not been discovered for many decades. Um, and so during this time, there are a number of um, Wahhabi scholarly families um, who, whose lineages originate from the Najd Highlands um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and what happens um, is that um, this scholarly elite is developing, but during the 1950s and 60s, when um, the Qatari state is expanding its capacity for the first time to spend the new oil and gas wealth that's coming into the treasury, um, there is this uh, sort of shortage of skilled labor, as it were. And at that time, the University of Medina, it has not yet been created. And so there is no um, labor surplus, as it were, of uh, Wahhabi trained ulama from which one could recruit uh, scholars. Um, and also at that time, um, Al-Azhar was, and it remains also, sort of the center that is producing trained ulama. Thus, um, when one um, Wahhabi scholar, as um, is tasked with creating a local uh, or creating an Islamic state, Islamic education system in Qatar, he goes to Al-Azhar um, to recruit scholars, um, which is when he meets Qala Dawi um, and brings him back uh, to Qatar. And then over time, um, Qala Dawi and his peers who come as members of the Azhar mission, um, very gradually um, supplant this local, um, this local scholarly elite and in effect replace them as it were. Um, and as you noted, um, the creation of a Wahhabi ulama establishment in Saudi Arabia is very much part of Saudi Arabian state building um, in the occupied Hejaz region, um, most notably, of course. And um, Saudi Arabia is a very diverse um, country um, in terms of population, um, religious affiliation and so on, whereas Qatar is not. And so there's not this same local need um, to invest in a um, Qatari national um, religious establishment. I also point out how sometimes um, this uh, su supplanting or eclipsing of the local establishment happens by, happens by chance also. Um, the way that when um, Yusuf al-Khaladawi is uh, running the religious institute in Doha, he is training um, the idea of being sort of train um, Qatari imams, religious officials, and so on and so forth. Um, part of his um, goal is that um, traditionally trained scholars should not simply be cloistered um, into the religious sector, for lack of a better term. Um, Islamically trained scholars should be able to work in all fields of life, um, diplomats, um, so on, um, education, and so on and so forth. And in effect, um, due to the success of that approach, um, many of the Qatari graduates from his religious institute do not go on, or the male graduates, do not go on to be ulama. They go on to take up fields um, as diplomats, for example, or other areas of Qatari national life. Thus, um, his Qatari graduates sort of do not become ulama and take up other fields, which in, in effect um, leads to the decline of the Qatari element of the scholarly elite. There seems to have been a sort of degree of Qatari naivete, if you wish, involved in the seeming belief that they could ring fence the Gulf in their support of protest and more open political systems. Bahrain is the obvious example. But Bahrain also sort of demonstrated that that notion of majoritar majoritarian democracy that um, Karadawi had was problematic, both in geopolitical terms, as well as in terms of, the, of, of, of notions of majority-minority relations, particularly because um, Bahrain is a majority Shiite country with a minority Sunni Muslim uh, ruling family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so when I was thinking about um, Qatar, Yusuf al Khaladawi, um, their engagement with the Bahraini uprising, and um, the way they were thinking about uh, majorities and minorities um, in democratic terms, 
um, what uh, came out to me um, during my fieldwork and thinking about this issue um, was the legacy of the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Right? Um, so perhaps um, just as much as their read, Card always reading of texts and traditions, um, his and his circle's understanding of the aftermath of the 2003 invasion and what happened shapes very much um, their approach to Bahrain. Right? Um, and this is something that was put to me was that um, their interpretation of what they saw, um, uh, to use a metaphor or an image that was put to me, was of being like Rwanda, as it were, when um, the Sunni minority is being um, killed by the Shia majority. Um, that very much shaped the way that they approached um, the Bahraini uprising and shaped their understanding of what would happen um, were um, the Bahraini uprising to be successful, um, which is very much an apologetic narrative, of just which was put to me, sort of justifying why he, um, why Cardoid failed to support the Bahraini uprising, because it was seen as a problem that had to be explained um, by Cardoid's circle with whom I was in conversation. Um, but I think the the legacy of the occupation of Iraq um, and its impact on the way. Um, the Arabs and Arab regimes in general, or Muslim scholars in particular, thought about um, democracy um, is something that has not yet been fully unpacked. Yeah, you know, we've we've talked about, uh, and you you know you mentioned this uh, early on that smaller Gulf states like uh, Qatar and the UAE had to turn to, to primarily Al Azhar, um, and. Uh, indirectly possibly the brotherhood in the early days to uh, because there were no alternatives for trained islamic scholars mm-hmm. uh you know it uh, clearly neither Qatar nor the uae today produce on any scale uh uh islamic scholars but if one takes away from you know allah's house largely and certainly the leadership of al support for uh, the Egyptian autocratic government, the, the, the nodes of debate uh, in the Arab world, in ter- of religious debate in the, in the Arab world, certainly about uh, political governance, have actually moved, in a sense, from, from Cairo to Doha and Abu Dhabi. You've mentioned that earlier on, both... Uh, Karadawi, who's now 96, Bimbaya is, if I'm not incorrect, 87. Uh, what happens when they both pass on? Um, with other words, uh, does that move back to, to Al-Azhar or to other um, institutions of Islamic learning? Or is there actually a next generation that can carry that on and maintain that that prominence, if you wish. Thank you. That's a really good question um, to think about. Um, and one of the things I talk about, um, first of all, in the conclusion of the book is um, to ask sort of the academic community to think about what it would mean to take um, Doha and Abu Dhabi um, seriously as centers or nodes of um, Islamic scholarly authority in the modern day, um, for better or for worse, right? Um, uh, I draw on the work of scholars like um, Zarina Graywell, who talk about um, originally Cairo, places like Cairo as um, historical centers of scholarship based on their um, history um, as use of crossroads and confluence of scholarship like Cairo, Medina, and places like that. Um, and one of the questions I um, ask um, here to think about is thinking about Doha and Abu Dhabi um, as places in contradistinction um, to those kinds of centers like Cairo and Medina, what it would mean um, to think about those places as more than just sites of fabulous wealth, um, as important as that is. Um, But just thinking about, um, to sort of speculate on what may happen, um, who will sort of replace um, Sheikh Al-Qalabawi, who retired in 2018, and Abdullah bin Beya, we can observe this sort of a new generation of scholars um, coming through um, Qaradawi's um, replacement as the head of the International Union of Muslim Scholars, Ahmed Ari Sunni, a Moroccan scholar, um, is very much of uh, the similar kind of intellectual um, 
lineage and orientation as Kaladawi, um, someone who believes very deeply um, in um, Islamic forms of democracy in the Arab world. Um, and he, um, at the same time, he doesn't seem to be uh, pursuing the same kind of global profile that Kaladawi did. And also after the Arab Spring, um, it's no longer possible in the same way to see Qatar as a sort of a place on the periphery um, where one could be independent um, in that kind of way and be safe from others, other regimes. And people no longer in the same way view Al Jazeera also as sort of a independent um, channel in the way it was before the Arab Spring. It wasn't really appreciated just how you know, strong Qatari influence was. So thus, um, though Ahmed Ari Sunni hasn't chosen to pursue that kind of global profile, he would never be seen in the same way as Qaradawi was um, prior to the Arab Spring as someone who had, um, who was sort of truly independent um, and gave off of that space. Um, um, in case of Abdullah bin Bayya, um, there are many people um, in his um, sort of following in his footsteps, um, the Yemeni scholar um, Habib um, Ali Jifri, for example, is also based primarily in Abu Dhabi, um, of yet from Yemen originally. Um, Hamza Youssef, the American scholar, also has close links um, to the UAE, um, and so I think um, you know, when it, when Abdullah bin Bayya, um retires, um, his uh, there are a number of protégés who will continue. Um, and it certainly seems that um, for the meantime, um, Abu Dhabi and the Emirati orientation um, is certainly in ascendance, um, certainly for the next years or decades to come. What is it that bound Karadawi and Bimbaya prior to the 2011 Arab revolts, given that their deep-seated differences presumably existed already prior to the revolt. So what, you know, they, they were very closely associated. Uh, Bimbaya was uh, uh, Karadawi's deputy uh, in the International Union of Muslim Scholars. He was very appreciative of uh, Karadawi's scholarship. So what was it that bound the two men, uh, given that they, that those differences were, were evident already earlier? Well, I think um, one thing is that there were differences in their understanding um, toward democracy. Um, Bin Bey was sort of skept very skeptical of the project um, before the Arab Spring, and that skepticism becomes an outright hostility as the Arab Spring unfolds. Um, but the reason they were close uh, prior to that is there had never really been an opportunity for those sort of political differences um, to be brought out. Right? There was never been there had never been opportunity for um, the possibility of democracies to emerge in the Arab world so widely. And thus, although they had different orientations in that regard, um, because those orient different orientations were never put to the test or given opportunity to be un to unfold, um, those never really came out into the open. Um, and also, uh, one thing I talk about in um, the start of the book is there are many categorizations of Islamic scholars that um, academics use um, for heuristic purposes of Wahhabi, Salafi, Islamist, Sufi, neo-traditionalist, and so on. And really, um, there are many boundaries um, that can be blurred between these sort of categorizations. And though these days, um, Abdullah bin Bayya is often categorized as a sort of neo-traditionalist scholar, as it were, someone who is sort of deeply critical of modernity and sees um, reviving authentic tradition um, to be the solution to the problems of the Arab world as he sees them, um, there are many overlaps and similarities um, in the way that um, Yusuf al-Qadawi and Abdullah bin Bey um, perceive um, the role of Islamic scholarly authority, the relationship between Islamic scholars and um, lay believers and so on, um, the solutions to the problems of the Arab world. So before, um, before the 2011 Arab Spring brought out their differences in terms of vis-a-vis sort of -vis democracy, um, they had many other overlaps um, and shared projects because simply there wasn't an opportunity to um, think about um, what dem democratic governments might actually look like in the Arab world, which the Arab Spring created an opportunity for. Karadawi obviously project, projects himself as a proponent of democracy. He's perceived as such. He's defined the essence of democracy as people choose who rules over them and manage their affairs. Mm -hmm. Yet he also seems to advocate, advocate uh, obedience to the ruler once elected, and in his responses to the protests against the elected uh, 
poster of Old Brotherhood President of Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, and the military coup, he seemed to um, uh, object to the right of protest, seemingly because it obviously didn't fit his political agenda. Yeah, so one of the things I think about in the book um, is this idea of um, this concept of consistency, inconsistency, hypocrisy, and so on, and the way that um, we as academics um, use a word like consistency or hypocrisy, rather, sort of seeking to measure um, what a scholar says in their books and then measure that against what they do when events unfold. Right? Um, and I think, um, and as I think about that, I draw on um, the work of Mohammed Qasim Zaman to say that the ulama are also activists too. They just engage events as they happen. And it's not really that useful um, to use a word like consistency or inconsistency if we're drawing, if we're measuring um, what someone says in their texts or what happens when things unfold in practice. Um, with that point in mind, when I'm thinking about, um, I, I thought it was something important to reflect on how and why uh, Yusuf al Qaradawi responded to the uprisings in early 2013, or the protests, uh, the Tamarat movement um, in early 2013, um, in a very sort of dismissive fashion. And um, consequently, as I was thinking about that, I wasn't looking so much at his reading of texts and traditions and measuring that against his actual political practice. And I was thinking more about um, drawing more my ethnographic fieldwork, drawing on the fact that um, he and his circle, um, were primarily, um, his circle primarily young men um, from Kyrie neighborhoods that would imply the affiliation with the Muslim Brotherhood who shared um, experiences of repression and torture um, at the hands of the Egyptian regime, um, sort of being attacked by hired thugs and so on. And so um, I posited the idea that as the protests against the Muslim Brotherhood are beginning, um, Muslim government rather, are beginning, um, it's not hard to imagine, um, based on their lived experiences, viewing that as some kind of conspiracy against the government, um, against the Morsi government, um, rather than seeing that, rather than using a word like hypocrisy or inconsistency. Um, I didn't feel that was uh, the right way to think about it at that time. And also, as we've seen um, since then, the work of um, Neil Ketchley, for example, and other scholars have shown that, of course, there was a huge discontent against the Morsi government uh, in early 2013. At the same time, we can see that um, states such as the UAE were very carefully involved in um, funding, planning, um, and instigating, to some extent, um, popular uprisings against the against the Muslim government. So when um, Khalid Dawi and his colleagues saw this as one big conspiracy, um, as I say in the book, they were at least partially correct. One. At the heart of the difference between Karadawi and, and uh, Bin Baya is also s seemingly the, a divide over what constitutes uh, temporal, what constitutes temporal, and what constitutes divine authority. Karadawi implicitly seems to reject the notion that democracy constitutes a denial of God's sovereignty because it recognizes the sovereignty of the people, and he argues that it co constitutes the ability to reject oppressive and tyr tyrannical rulers. Do you see that as a divide between the two men? You know, I see them as similar. And I don't, I think what I think about when we talk about Abdullah bin Bayer, for example, and what I'm thinking about in, my, in the book is not so much um, that Abdullah bin Bayer um, uses a sort of um, imagine a kind of pre-modern or medieval Islamic cosmology, right? A sort of um, Al-Ghazali-esque divine system where you have um, sort of everyone working in concert, a kind of autocrat at the top, with uh, working with the other mayor and sort of um, presiding over the, the masses, right, um, in that sense, which some, um, which some academics um, emphasize, right? And so what I'm thinking more about um, in my book is rather that when Abdullah bin Bayya, for example, um, imagines autocracy in the Arab world, I emphasize that it's less about, in my view at least, less about his reading of um, pre modern traditions and texts, and more about um, his very close personal relationship with Sheikh Zayed al-Nahyan, um, that goes back to the 1970s. Um, Sheikh Zayed um, 
branded himself as a benevolent humanitarian, right, as a pious benevolent humanitarian. And I argue in the book that when Bin Beya is talking about autocracy in the Arab world and imagining a kind of pious autocrat, he's thinking of someone like Sheikh Zayed, right, with whom he had a very close relationship and who he admired very much so. And he extends that admiration to his children. Um, and so when I'm thinking about, um, I prefer to draw out um, or highlight the importance of modern history and the way that Kaladawi and Bimbe are reading modern events um, or interpreting historical events in the Arab world recently, um, rather than attributing um, the sort of foundational essential differences to reading of texts. Because um, one thing also, I find that um, it can be difficult to um, disentangle a truly um, unblemished or authentic um, Islamic or non-Islamic interpretation of texts and traditions. For example, um, when Yusuf al-Qaladawi talks about his understanding of Islamic democracy, um, he talks about invi inviolable um, values, right, that the state must defend, okay, there are there's certain Islamic public values the state must uphold. Um, now, on the one hand, what he's doing there is he's drawing on a concept of public order, which is a genealogically French concept from the 19th century, right? that societies have inalienable values the state must uphold. So on the one hand, so rather than thinking about what someone like Yusuf al-Qaradawi is doing in terms of Islamic democracy or non-Islamic democracy, I think sometimes it can be better to think about these figures as entangled um, with global changes. Right? And the same with Abdullah bin Bayer, right? when he's thinking about um, autocracy, um, there is a cross-pollination um, with... Um, Conservative thinkers in the US, for example, he's also reading and thinking, thinking about, not just simply pre-modern scholarly authorities. So for me, I think talking about Islamic democracy is a very worthwhile, important endeavor. But I sort of see my book as being complementary to that kind of effort and thinking about um, more recent um, events and more recent um, impacts on those readings too. The divide between Karadawi and uh, Bin Bayez basically produced uh, two, we'll call it schools of jurisprudence, if you wish, Karadawi's Fikal Taura, or the jurisprudence of the um, of the revolution, versus um, uh, Bin Bayez Fikal Slim, the jurisprudence of peace. Do you see that jurisprudence playing out in both Gata's religious and diplomatic outreach? and that of the UAE? I think um, for a brief period, um, 2011 to 2012, um, there was a moment when um, Kalabawi's uh, Fikathaura, this Jewish prince of revolution, um, had an opportunity to be um, sort of promulgated um, and lend support um, to those who would find that, that argumentation, that rationale um, inspiring and important. I think what I talk about, uh, going back to this idea that I see many similarities between Abdullah bin Beya and Khaled Ali's, um approach, um, I see many structural similarities between Fiqh Thawra and the Fiqh Sil, the jurisprudence of peace that Abdullah bin Beya um, promulgates, in as much as um, their style of argumentation works in very similar ways. Um, both these two projects um, take pre-existing um, Islamic concepts and expand or contract their um, remits. Right? So, for example, um, as uh, Yusuf al Qabadawi um, is thinking about um, legitimizing the right to peacefully protest, um, he contracts a pre-existing um, forbiddance of rebellion against the ruler, broadly understood. And he thus qualifies that to say, um, rebellion is only, only armed rebellion. Is forbidden, right? And he thus contracts that concept. But elsewhere, he expands other pre existing concepts. For example, by saying um, the um, individual um, need to provide advice um, to a ruler is expanded to a communal um, obligation, which is thus exemplified by peaceful protest. Use uh, Dal Ben Beya does the, op does the same technique, but in the opposite way. He thus expands. Um, the uh, forbiddance of rebellion against a ruler to say that, to argue that peaceful protests will always, by definition, lead to armed conflict, and thus peaceful protests should also be forbidden. And the reason he does that 
I argue, is based on, for example, example, his understanding of the Algerian civil war and the occupation of Iraq and what would happen when um, democracies emerge in states where the divides are too large, right? Um, whereby um, minorities simply cannot accept um, losing elections, right? And will therefore do anything to um, offset losing an election, right? Which is based on his reading of modern history rather than pre-modern authorities, I argue. Um, and thus, I think in terms of lastly, um, the idea of the impact of Fikasilm um, this jurisprudence of peace, this project that Abdullah bin Bayer is theorizing and promulgating. Um, at this point, in my view, I see it as something that is first and foremost being produced um, as part of the state, ban- state branding project of the UAE, right? Um, the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies so that was created in A2014, um, so bin Bayer and the Ease of Marquee um, project. Uh, it has every December um, sort of enormous. Um, interfaith gatherings, that's sort of the marquee event in the interfaith calendar, where um, you have visitors of Americans and Europeans, uh, Jewish and Christian um, religious leaders, diplomats, um, those invested in ideas of international religious freedom. Um, and I think a big part of those kind of projects are for showing um, foreign powers um, the importance of the UAE um, as a partner sort of use the phrase of in reforming Islam from within, as um, it would, as the saying would go, or um, promoting moderate Islam, as the saying would go. Um, and I don't think there's actually any real, um, there's necessarily any efforts to actually implement or um, promulgate or disseminate these kinds of, um, or whatever the UAE is, um, is attempting to theorize of in any sort of um, meaningful or sincere way. David, unfortunately, the clock is ticking. We could go on for another hour, but time is running out. However, before I let you go, tell us what you're working on now and what your next project will be. Thank you. So my next project is um, continuing these themes of thinking about the relationship between religious elites and regimes in the Gulf. And I'm thinking about um, the politics of interfaith dialogue in the UAE, um, particularly thinking about um, in the aftermath of the Abraham Accords, thinking about the ways that um, Jewish, Christian and Muslim elites in Abu Dhabi um, attempt to engage in um, very sincere and thought-provoking interfaith dialogue with each other um, in an environment where there are very clear expectations as to what those kinds of dialogues should produce um, and I'm interested in thinking about um, interfaith dialogue forums when um, Emirati officials are very much present and there's a securitization, as it were, of um, interfaith relations and interfaith dialogue in the UAE, which um, builds on this current project we've been talking about today, the idea of state branding, presenting the UAE as a haven of interfaith toleration in a region that's caricatured as uniquely intolerant of religious difference, for example. David Warren, that sounds like a great project. Thank you for being on the show today. I really enjoyed it. All the best and take care. Thank you so much, James.